Well, as you know, last week I covered the first few chapters of the book of Mark, and we are going through the book of Mark uh, in order to have one of the most important things, and maybe the most important thing that as a human being anyone could ever have in their mind. See, we often focus as the Passover, uh, the death of Jesus, the death, uh, his resurrection, and how important that is. But see, the entirety of his life, the entirety of the activities that he had with those who were becoming his followers, those he would select to be his apostles, those who would he would direct in so many different ways, his interaction with people. And, of course, he interacted with Roman officials and with uh, certainly the religious leaders of the Jewish nation that he lived in, uh, and then all the people, the people that he had so much love for. They were to have love for all the people that are around us. We don't have a lot in common with many people because our belief system is that much different. They just they can't comprehend why would you be sitting here on Saturday morning. It's just not something that uh, people can wrap their mind around. But see, Jesus fully understood that, and he even even explained that as as we covered in part last week. Uh, but it's important to have not just his death, although that is what we focus on toward the time of the Passover. Uh, to have a, an idea of the entirety of his life. He lived in Galilee, meaning the kind of the general area of Galilee, as we looked at on the map, the northern part of Israel. Uh, he was familiar with the, you know, the Sea of Galilee. You often see him out traveling on the, on the sea. Uh, I would assume he, he probably knew quite a bit about that, even though by occupation, he was more of a carpenter or a construction worker. Uh, he, he grew up awaiting, awaiting an important, he was preparing for the time when the father would direct that he would begin a ministry that would last for the last three and a half years of his life. And yet the first part of that would primarily be now, he did travel to Jerusalem, as we know, with his family when he was 12. I'm sure he traveled there at other times. It wasn't all that far, 20, 30 miles, but from Nazareth. But he had a lot of interaction with the people in and around this, the area of Galilee. And we covered last week, in the first uh, four chapters of Mark, how that he primarily was preaching the kingdom of God. You know, that's very clearly stated. Uh, that he, he wasn't talking altogether about himself, as so many people do today. And yet, certainly we want to know as much as we can about our Savior and our Lord and how it was that he as a human being, being God in the flesh, how he conducted himself, what he did. You often see him off praying. You often see him close to his father in that way. To his disciples, I'm sure that was kind of mysterious because they were, you know, they were always wondering, you know, where is he? What's he doing? And they wanted to, they wanted to learn. But he proclaimed the kingdom that was coming. And see, that message was a little bit apprehensive to the Romans. It was apprehensive to the Jewish leaders. But to mostly the people, they were, they were thinking, oh, a kingdom is coming. Are you going to be our king? Uh, can, will you free us from this enslavement we have to Rome? But of course, that wasn't what he was meaning at all. He was meaning what all of us understand to be uh, the coming rule of Jesus Christ on earth. And we are schooled in that because we observe the holy days and we observe the Feast of Tabernacles. And we know that in the progression of what God is going to do, that that is uh, the primary intervention in world affairs. It is going to change everything. And that's what he proclaimed. 
We also read about, even in the first few chapters here, about how different, different situations required healing from God. And he extended that to people. He did that freely. He often did that just, um, you know, it almost seems like uh, it, was, it was something that was kind of brought to him. People would come to him. And yet, it's amazing to see how he described those healings. He certainly was not thinking about himself. He was not thinking about, you know, I'm, I'm so wonderful. I'm so fabulous. You know, he was always aware that the works that he was doing was, they were the works of the Father. We said, as we pointed out, he spoke in parables. And so he did that again for a reason. So to some, God would offer understanding and see why we're sitting here today is not because of our brilliance, not because of our uh, extraordinary uh, wisdom or nobility, in the world, but because of God revealing truth, revealing an understanding, and then of course he can conceal that as much as he wants. That's what Jesus directly said. He showed how the Sabbath should be observed, not only that it should be, but that how it should be observed. And we saw a number of different incidents where the spirit world clearly understood who this son of man was. They stood, they fully understood because we see that repeated in numerous ways. So I, I remind you of that because today we want to go through uh, from about Mark 5 to 8. We're going to cover those eight chapters. See, that's half of the chapters that we read in the book of Mark. Uh, and this kind of concludes his ministry in the area of Galilee. Because he was going to have a ministry there, he would travel, which we'll go over next week. He would travel kind of from the north and down toward the south and ultimately be, of course, in Jerusalem and have a ministry there. And then finally, you know, he will fulfill what the Bible had repeatedly said he was to do, which was to die for the sins of mankind. So I'll go through uh, four. I guess I will say four different things here today. Uh, the first one is that Jesus was doing, as he was healing or as he was raising the dead, which he did, he was doing the works of the Father. The healing, and I know we often, we seek that, you know, whenever we hurt, when we, we want to get out of that, if, there's a way to do it. We want to be better. We want to improve. Uh, but healing is a work of the Father. And so we need to study that, and it is rehearsed here in this section. Uh, you clearly see that Jesus did some things that are covered, covered here in this area. Uh, he did it simply out of compassion for those who were in need. He was incredibly attuned to the even the physical needs. He would often tell, well, whenever he raised a girl from the dead, uh, or everybody thought she was dead, and he said she's just asleep. But he said, give her something to eat. I mean, he understood the, the humanity of people. He comprehended that because he had created it, and he was now uh, living it. So that's the second thing we'll cover. The third thing will be how that, in numerous instances, Jesus revealed who he was. Now, that, of course, is for our benefit today because we can read it and benefit from it, understand what John 17.3 said. John 17.3 says, This is eternal life that you know. Know you, talking about the Father, the only true God, and that you know the one that he sent to the earth. See, that's, that. If, if we know that, if we know that in the degree to which God intends, you know, that is, you know, in a sense, kind of a culmination of what we will be as the children of God. 
So Jesus revealed who he was through activity. He also explained, the fourth thing I'll mention is the narrow path of following him. He said, this is not going to be easy. This is, in a sense, uh, the hard path, the hard way, the narrow way, a way that fewer are going to take than the wide and broad way that will lead to destruction. Destruction. So uh, those are things that we can focus on here, at least four points that we'll cover today. Uh, he also begins, and I'll add this as a fifth point, I guess, he begins to tell them, and mostly he was just telling the disciples. He wasn't telling everybody else, but he was telling the disciples what's going to happen. What's going to happen in Jerusalem? And it's interesting to see the statements that we find here in Mark and in other of the gospel writers, how that they heard it, but they didn't, they didn't grasp the significance of what he was really telling them was going to happen. And we see that even by the trauma <laughs> that they were going to endure. They were going to suffer through that time and in a sense kind of become un, uh, well, not glued together, become where, you know, they, they were just scattered. And yet they had a common goal, a common mission. They knew what he had said. They knew what he predicted. And so he foretold you know, what was going to happen. Let's go to Mark 5. And this is in connection with the first point I'm going to make. He was doing the works of the Father whenever he was healing. Here in Mark chapter 5, in verse 21, you know, you see Jesus actually in this whole section, verse 21 to verse 43, that uh, Jesus was being sought out by one of the leaders in the synagogue. His name was Jairus. And he came to Jesus and begged him, my little daughter, in verse 23, is at a point of death, come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And so Jesus was heading that direction. He was going to be helping Jairus because Jairus had, had come pleading. You know, the, you know the, the synagogue was a familiar place for religious people to come together and honor God. But Jesus was willing to help them even though they didn't understand who he was. And it says in verse 25, a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him in verse 24. And now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years, and she had endured much from many physicians. And so sometimes you find, you know, that we go through a lot of things uh, trying to seek help. In this case, this woman was. She'd spent all that she had. She was no better, but rather worse. He'd heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. And she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well and immediately. And we may have mentioned that last time, but certainly you, know, you see that in Mark's writing. He says immediately this happened. Immediately we went somewhere. Immediate, he uses that word a lot. But immediately her hemorrhages stopped in verse 29. She felt in her body that she was healed. Immediately, in verse 30, aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said, You see the crowd pressing on her and you ask, Who touched you? You know, they were amazed. You know, here we are jostling along in this mob and you're asking us who touched you. But he looked all around to see who had done it, and the woman, knowing what had happened, came to in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And so there are numerous things that are pointed out. You know, was Jesus aware of the power of God going out of him at that point? Well, yeah, he said, I, I know somebody touched me, and I know the power of God. 
But see, what he was doing was he was doing the works of the Father. The Father was providing that healing. That's what he said. The works are the works of the Father. And so, you know, this woman uh, who in faith had approached Jesus, that's another lesson that we learned from that, that, well, we want to come to God in faith. Uh, we want to live in faith. We want to be faithful. Now, does God immediately change everything? No. But that's one lesson that he wants us to be reinforced in is that, well, we want to continue to have faith and come to him uh, to be encouraged. And so we go on in verse 35, while he was speaking to them, some people came from the Jarius's house, said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher anymore? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, don't be afraid. Don't be timid. Just believe. And so now he's taught about faith. The woman who snuck up behind him and touched his robe, or the fringe of his robe. And in essence here, he was saying, you've got to believe. And see, again, that's a, that's a point uh, that is often overlooked, that without believing, all of us believe that God exists. And we believe that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. But what Jesus told Jarius is that just continue to believe. And in verse 37, he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion and people were weeping and wailing loudly and he entered the house and says, why are you making this commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. So again, another point, what is death? Death is the cessation of this physical life, but it's like sleep. He points this out about Lazarus very clearly in John 11, but it's also pointed out here about this child. He said, she's, she's asleep or uh, waiting for him. But of course, in verse 40, they laughed at him. And he put all of them outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him. So Peter and James and John were there, went in where the child was, took her by the hand, said, Talitha, come, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about, and she was 12. At this, they were overcome with amazement. See, what was he doing? Well, he was, he was revealing the works of the father to Jarius and to his wife who were so concerned over their daughter. But also, he was pointing out to Peter and James and John, you know, that, you know, they are interacting, you know, with the Son of God. That's what he wanted them to to understand. In verse 43, he strictly ordered them that no one should know about this and told them to give her something to eat. So he was concerned about her because she needed nourishment. But he also was uh, helping the disciples and you know, these other Jewish people to comprehend how he was doing uh, the work of the Father. In this case, in verse 43, he told them, don't tell anybody. And so I would imagine, I mean, see, depending on the setting, you see, you tell, you see him say, go tell everyone on one hand, and then in another case, he says, don't do it. But there were reasons for that, uh, that he uh, was controlling. Let's go on to Mark 6, because you see the situation about how he, much compassion Jesus had uh, for those in need. You see in Mark 6 uh, that a little later on in the chapter, uh, you see the interaction here between King Herod, his wife, and uh, her daughter, and how that, you know, John the Baptist had been imprisoned and then eventually had been put to death. They asked for the head of John the Baptist in verse 24, and so the king, even though he 
had thought he had made an incredibly stupid move by saying, you know, I'll do anything. He says, I want you, or that was a request. Yet out of regard for his oath and for the guest, he was overwhelmed. He didn't want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier with orders to bring John's head, and he went and beheaded him in the prison. Brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. See, that's, that's an incredibly sad, that's often a dramatic uh, production if they try to make that into a TV thing, uh, when they do, because they have done that many times. Uh, and yet it, it was the conclusion of the life of the servant of God. He had completed his mission. Now, his mission was to pave the way for the coming of the Lord. John understood that. Uh, as you see kind of him described in numerous places, he was uh, loud and often drew crowds that were a little unusual, but he was baptizing people, telling them they need to repent of their sin. That's, that's the predecessor to really coming to know Jesus Christ. People have to come to see their sins and repent. But what I want to focus on is, verse 29, his disciples heard about it, and they came and they took his body and laid it in the tomb. See, some of his disciples were now disciples of Jesus. Certainly Andrew was, uh, maybe Philip, maybe others, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. But the apostles, at least it appears from what we read in the book of uh, the first part of, uh, I think it's in Luke or Matthew, you see that there were two. No, it's in John, the first chapter of John. You know, there were two of John's disciples who were following Jesus and, oh, this looks like what we're looking for. And so clearly they were, they were distraught with John's death. And the apostles in verse 30 gathered around Jesus, told him everything that had been done and all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, I want you to come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest for a while. For many were coming and going and they, they couldn't even eat. See, apparently there would be times, you know, when we just need to get away. Times when we just need to be able to rest. And in this case, I would think you'd say certainly the disciples of John and maybe all of the disciples of Jesus were grieving because, you know, they thought John was extraordinary. They thought John was special. They were grieving the loss of a friend and leader. And yet, as Jesus told them, Verse 32, they went away in a boat to a deserted place, so they were trying to get away by themselves. And yet many, in verse 33, saw them going and recognized them and hurried there on foot all the towns, uh, from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. And as he went ashore, and here's the crowd again. You know, they try to get away. They try to relax. They try to rest for a little bit or maybe just process. What just happened? You know, this, this is terrible. John the Baptist has been put to death. But what we see in verse 34 is he went ashore, he saw a crowd, and he had compassion on this crowd. See, Jesus has compassion on those who are in need, as we also should have compassion on those who are suffering or who are in need. And he goes ahead, and I won't go through the rest of this uh, uh, section here. But you see, this is a description of him feeding 5,000 people. You know, he says, you know, we've got a big, huge group of people. Verse 37, you give them something to eat, he said to the disciples, and they said, how are we going to do that? And so he brought the five loaves and two fish, and taking the loaves and fish, he looked up to heaven blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. He had 
not only compassion for his disciples, but he had compassion for these people who, who were out here and who were following him and listening to him and running out of food. And so he provided that food because he was able to do that. In chapter 6, down through, I guess, verse 30, 34, I mentioned that he had compassion upon them. And let's jump on to chapter 8, because you see Mark recording two different incidents. This one was a group of 5,000 in chapter 8, verse 1. You see, in essence, the same thing happening. He was feeding 4,000 people in this case. In those days, in verse 1, there was again a great crowd without anything to eat. All the disciples said to them, I have compassion for this crowd. Because they've been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry, they'll faint on the way. Some of them will have, they have come from a great distance. His disciples replied, how can one feed these people with bread here in the desert? And so again, he goes through the same process of seeing what they have, asking for God's blessing, and then providing the food. In this case, for verse 9, 4,000 people. Jesus displayed this kind of compassion even when he would have been grieving for his cousin and someone he actually not only liked a lot, but that he commended in the highest manner as far as John the Baptist having such an incredible role, but having done such a good job even laying down his life for Jesus Christ. Now, John didn't know he was going to do it that way, I imagine. But that's what we all have to think about as far as how much does God expect us to be uh, committed to him unto the end. That That's what he wants. The third thing I mentioned is that you see examples of Jesus uh, revealing who he was. Let's back up to chapter 5. See, here in chapter 5, you see Jesus dealing with a, an individual who is uh, afflicted with an evil spirit. And clearly the, the spirit knows who he is. In verse 6, when Jesus came, the spirit or the man who had the spirit ran and bowed down before him shouted at the top of his voice, What have I you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. And of course, this was a case where you know, he, he was going to send these demons, because there were far more than one, send them into the 2,000 pigs, and they were going to run off you know, into the lake, into the sea. And so you know, the case was that even in this what, what Mark records is that the identity of Jesus is very clear to us. See, we don't see the spirit world. We don't see, you know, the angelic beings. You know, we, we know they exist because the Word of God tells us they exist. And we know they certainly recognized who Jesus was. And of course, Jesus didn't want them advertising who he was. That's not good advertising. You know, that, that's a poor way to get his message out. But you see that the man who had been afflicted, let's see what the outcome was in verse 15. When they came back to Jesus, and saw the demonic sitting there clothed and in his right mind. And every the very man who had had this legion of devils, they were afraid. Those who had seen what happened had come. They began to beg Jesus to leave. But Jesus and the man asked Jesus, well, can I go with you? But Jesus, verse 19, refused and said, go home to your friends. Tell them how much the Lord has done for you. Okay, we read an incident where he said, don't tell anybody about it earlier. Here he says, well, you need to go back. You need to tell people what the Lord has done for you. 
what mercy he has shown you. And so he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis, which was a pagan area on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. The people there were, were not Jewish. Uh, they obviously had a herd of pigs. It wouldn't have been too useful in, in Judah. But he said, I want you to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. That was, that was his directive, to go and do the job. Go, go and preach the good news. And so in this case, we see you know, Jesus revealing who he is. In chapter 6, you have a short account of Jesus walking on the water. This is an illustration that we often go through. I'm not going to go through this in detail. But see, Jesus is showing his power as God, God in the flesh, as he did this. You can see that he was with his disciples. He sent them out in the boat, but in verse 46, saying farewell to them, he went up in the mountain to pray. See, that was commonly what he was going to do. You know, he wasn't with them. Verse 47, when evening came, the boat was out of the sea. He was alone on land, and he could see them. He saw they were straining at the oars against an averse wind because it became it became early in the morning, so it would appear to be between three and six in the morning. He was walking on the sea and looked like he was going by them, but when they saw them, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, and they all saw him and were terrified, but immediately he spoke to them and said, what did he say? He was meeting them in an extraordinary way. He was meeting them as he was walking on the water. He was going to display who I am. He's going to display the power of God as he walks out there. And of course, I'm not sure exactly since Mark was basically a disciple of Peter. I'm not sure why Mark didn't include the little incident with Peter getting out and walking on the water a little, but maybe he wasn't too proud of sinking in the water. I don't know. But see, you don't see that here. You see that in Matthew and I think in Luke. Uh, Matthew for sure. Because, you know, this was something that, you know, what we're seeing, what Mark writes, Jesus uh, said to them, take heart, it is I. That's the way it's written in some of them. But he was really saying, and when you look at the wording of that, he was saying, I am. I am, which is the name that we see God using in the Old Testament. He says, take heart, I am, I exist. Do not be afraid. See, he was identifying himself as the one in Exodus 3 who was with Moses. Who was with Moses whenever he was going into Pharaoh. Here in Exodus 3, verse 13, Moses is talking to the I Am. He's talking to God. He says, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they say, Well, what is his name? What shall I say? So God said to Moses, Say that I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent you to me, or sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my title for all generations my name forever forever and ever so that's what uh, Jesus was telling the guys who were in the boat we go back to Mark 6 again Mark chapter 6 
in verse 50, he is mentioning to them. And then he got into the boat with them. The wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they didn't understand about the, you know, verse 52 I'll mention a little bit later. He got into the boat, and the wind stopped. See, now this, in many ways, reveals who Jesus is, in that he says, you know, my name is I Am. He was the one who had been with Moses, and the one who had been talking to Moses, the one who had brought everything that is into existence. But also, he was the one who was able to walk on the water. You have biblical references in the Old Testament to Jesus walking, or to God, you know, walking on the water, or having rule over the wind and the waves. There are a lot of verses that uh, we won't try to go through right now regarding that. But, Let's go on down here in chapter 8, Mark chapter 8, to a section that begins in verse 27. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? He actually directly would bring this up a little bit later. Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, well, some say you're John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others say one of the prophets. But he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, Peter answered him and says, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. And again, in verse 30, Jesus sternly ordered them not to tell anybody about it. Why was he doing that? Well, he says, yes, that's true, but I'm not needing to proclaim that right yet. I want you to understand it. For all of us here in this room, we can understand that. We can comprehend who Jesus was. But, you know, Peter was given that information from the Father. We read that in another account. He said, the Father has revealed an understanding to you of who I am. And if we go back to them walking on the water in chapter 6, after he had climbed into the boat and the wind had ceased and everyone was amazed, in verse 52, 652, they didn't understand about the loaves and their hearts were hardened. That's an unusual statement for Mark to add at that point. But see, what Jesus in this whole section is describing, that, that they had failed to comprehend the miracles that they had seen. They were, you can see that they were stunned, they were shocked, they were amazed. But their heart was not yet open to fully comprehend that Jesus was the bread of what? He was the source of living water. This is what he often was sharing with them and recording in the Bible. And they would clearly understand it later. But we see it as an indication of how it is, you know, that he is that miraculous bread of life. How he is the one who would be written about in that way in John 6, and that he, you know, would be the one who would, you know, redeem the world. So you see several accounts here in Mark about Jesus revealing who he is, revealing his name, making the connection to the Old Testament. The fourth thing, the Last thing we'll try to cover here. The fifth one was simply foretelling what was going to happen, and we'll go over go over that more next time. But the fourth thing is that it's a narrow path following Jesus Christ is not a wide path. Here in Mark chapter six, we will go to that. Chapter six. 
verse 2. It says, On the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue. And his disciples followed or began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. And they said, Where does this man get all of this wisdom? What is his wisdom that has been given? What deeds of power have he done by his hand? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph, and Judas and Simon, and are not all his sisters here with us? See, they knew his family. You know, Jesus had followed in the occupation of his of his physical father, being uh, Joseph. He was a carpenter. He was following that occupation, and yet they knew. You know, he's he's got several brothers. There's a couple of them named here, James and Jude, are going to be writing books of the Bible later on when they would come to fully believe. But it says they took offense at him. And Jesus said, well, prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin, in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. You know, this this obviously was among the people at his home in Nazareth. They knew who he was. They knew where he came from. He knew his background. He knew his family. But what did he say about them? Well, I'm amazed at your unbelief. He was amazed at their unbelief. See, it's important, and that's part, part of what we will find regarding you know, the path that you, uh, we are expected to follow. We're expected to follow uh, the narrow path that begins with belief. And in chapter 8, verse 34, chapter 8, verse 34, he's told them what's going to happen in verse 31 in Jerusalem, but he says in verse 34, he called the crowd with his disciples and said, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. See, so not only the disciples, the ones who would be the, the apostles, but also others of the Jewish community, if they were going to believe who Jesus was, they were going to have to make a commitment that would be far deeper than that. If anyone had become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Verse 38, those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. He talks about the devotion and the commitment that is going to be required to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Now he was sharing all that with Many people there in Galilee, most of them didn't understand, but the disciples were starting to understand. And even as I mentioned, uh, the last thing we will point out here in verse 31, he began to teach them, this is in chapter 8, verse 31, teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. See, he, he repeats this several times, and we'll go over that next time. But see, he wanted them to comprehend that what I'm going to go through is not going to be pretty. It's going to be terrible. And you are going to be shocked. And you are going to be scattered. But through belief and faith and commitment to me, because that's where our commitment is. It is to God and it is to Jesus as 
our Lord and our Savior. See, that's why it's important to have you know, the life of Jesus reviewed in our mind all the time. I mean, yes, he gives parables. Some of them are harder to understand than others. And we fully understand some of them anyway. Some of them are harder. But he's the one who can rescue us. He's the one who can save us from the only other option, which is death. Because you know, we want to be forgiven. Uh, certainly the disciples at that time wanted to be uh, they wanted to be followers of Jesus. They wanted to say, and you even see them saying at times, yes, we can. We will run through the wall for you. <laughs> Turns out that they didn't quite have that kind of ability yet. And they didn't understand what he was saying. But he wants us to understand. He wants us to understand the commitments that we make toward him and toward the Father, and toward eternal life, that God is bringing about the most incredible miracle of all, and that is to be converted. To be converted from our human, frail, physical form to a glorified Son of God. So next time we'll go through 9 and 10, because during... These two chapters, you see him traveling from the north part of Israel up around the Sea of Galilee, even beyond that, probably to Mount Hermon. You see him traveling down and ultimately being in Jerusalem for the ministry that he would have there. And we'll cover that in our next, our next time here in Fulton.